Hello, chemistry students. We're going to move on to the next little part here. The last video I did was on structural formulas. Remember that you can email me if you have questions on things or if you're really struggling, if we have to look up, look at maybe pairing some people up to kind of help each other. Um, please, you know, feel free to reach out to other people in the class as well. Like sometimes, sometimes I think having things explained you know, by another classmate who really understands it is also really, really good. Um, simply because you, a lot of times you understand each other's kind of misconceptions or confusion better than I can understand it because I'm old and I've done this a long time. Sometimes I just, um, I might not be able to foresee why you're confused about something. So please do help each other out through this. If you if you are really struggling, though, please do reach out and, and let me know that. Um, so a couple of things I want to tie up. We did talk briefly about what an isomer was. I don't remember if I gave you this page of notes or not. Um, so a, an isomer is just um, two molecular structures that have the same formula, but they're different in structure. So a stereoisomer is these two, you can see, are actual mirror images of each other. And if I lined them up, if the right yellow and blue are right represent different um, elements, these are these are mirror structures of each other, not not um, identical structures. That's what makes them isomers. The other, um, so this would, here's a <clears throat> excuse me, couple of structural formulas. Both of these are are types of butane, and they have the same chemical formula, but you can see the structure is different. And this is actually one of them that you would have built in the molecular model lab that we started. I may at some point um, just do a video of that lab um, so that you can continue filling that out. Um, but this, you can see the carbons are all lined up in a straight line. And this one, we have three carbons in a straight line and then a middle one branching off, which makes it a completely different structure um, it's both butane, they have slightly different properties. This is butane, iso simply means from the center. Um, this is organic chem. The name kind of tells us a little bit about that structure. But again, you can kind of see, um, same formula, different structures. Um, some molecules are, so this is ozone. This is actually ozone that you would find up in the atmosphere. I'm going to move my, so you can see that. It's just saying that there's a double bond, so it's an oxygen, it's three oxygens bonded together, and one of the sides has to be double bonded, and it's just saying the double bond kind of resonates back and forth, like for a while the double bond is here, and then it flips, and the double bond goes over here, and then this is single bonded, so it just resonates back and forth, um, just to understand what, what resonation or resonating structures means. Um, and again, this is simply definition. I'm probably not going to have you do anything with this, but there's something called Vesper theory that states um, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So re it's kind of, um, water is actually a good example of, of a representation of this Vesper theory. So remember that like charges repel each other. And so since electrons are negative, electrons don't really want to be by each other. They like to exist in pairs, kind of orbiting around each other. Um, but in the case of like, so this is water, and we always say, I always say water looks a little bit like this Mickey Mouse ear structure where we have this one's upside down. But if this is kind of Mickey's face and then these are the ears, um, that's just kind of the structure and how it is. And it's because we have two unshared pairs of electrons Here's a pair, and here's a pair, and those negative charges repel each other, and they force the hydrogens that are bonded um, to be equidistant or away from these electron uh, pairs. But the hydrogens, of course, wouldn't stick to each other because they also have electrons orbiting around them. So there's also a, a repulsion force here between these two, so these are repelled because of the hydrogen um, or the electrons orbiting around the outside, 
but they will not be pushed any further apart because they start to be repelled by these electrons. So basically, Vesper theory just says, hey, they kind of force each other into these specific shapes. If I have something like a boron with three fluorine, remember boron is one of those exceptions um, that can be satisfied with only, um, with only six. So it's saying when that happens, these, these fluorine are all going to be equidistant apart from each other. No two fluorines are going to be closer to each other. And I know I'm a bad artist and it might look like they are, but they're all exactly 120 degree angles um, pretty much because the electrons around these fluorines are all repelling each other with equal force. So that's all that Vesper theory is just a big fancy term for that. All right, the, but the, what I really wanted to talk about in this video is um, our theory of electronegativity and how we use electronegativity um, to kind of make some predictions um, and how to determine polarity. So in your packet that you got, one of the things that you have is this. Um, so pull this out and maybe look at this while we're going through the video. Um, it just says electronegativity, and it has some, some uh, terms and rules at the top. But then at the bottom is a periodic table. And this, peri this is a periodic table of um, electronegativities. And if you look at this, so every element on here has been assigned a number or value. Um, and if you look carefully, there's one group of elements that's completely missing from this table and it is the noble gases. So the noble gases actually um, don't have electronegativity values. Electronegativity is the degree of attraction of electrons. So it really is how closely or with what, um, how strongly an element um, is going to pull electrons toward itself. And remember we said, and that has everything to do with, so how, how much they want to bond with other things by pulling those electrons toward themselves. And remember we said the noble gases really don't want to bond with, with anyone, so they don't have an electronegativity value. They don't want to form bonds with anything. They want to be all by themselves. Um, so we just, we don't represent them on this table because their electronegativity value would essentially be zero, and so nobody cares, right? Um, so electronegativity, you'll notice this little table at the top. It talks about ionic, polar covalent, nonpolar covalent. And um, basically, if we, if we take the values from on the bottom, we can determine whether a bond is ionic covalent and whether it's polar covalent or nonpolar covalent. And here's how we tell that. So let's say I'm looking at the electronegativity value of sodium and chlorine, and, and when those combine, the difference in electronegativity would be 3.0 minus 0 0.9. By the way, by the way, this is always an absolute value, um, meaning that it's always it's never going to be a negative number. That difference is 2.1. If I look at the scale on the top of my sheet, 2.1 falls in between 1.7 and 4. So that tells me that it's ionic. I already knew that was ionic, though, because remember I said ionic. Ionic compounds always contain metals. Or if a metal is contained, it's always ionic. Um, so I did know already that that was ionic. Remember when we look at the periodic table, just popping back to this. Oh, I don't know. It's not, there we go. Remember that all of these are metals. You guys studied the periodic table already. All this stuff up to the zigzaggy line, these are all metals. So over 80% of the periodic table are metals. But if any of these are included in the formula, it's always ionic because those are metals, okay? So it's true, this would be classified as, as ionic. All right, so let's look at 
uh, the water molecule, hydrogen and oxygen bonded together. We're just going to, we just are going to look at the difference between the hydrogen and oxygen on one of these bonds. They're both going to be the same, so we just really need to look at one. So 3.5. If I did my math right, 1.4. Again, if I look on my chart here, 1.4 falls in the polar covalent category. So this one would be polar covalent. What that means is, so the electronegativity value of oxygen is 3.5. This is my more negative end. This is my more positive end. And there's a difference in charges between these two ends. It's definitely polar. And honestly, just um, the fact that water, the water molecule is polar is why it has all of those really unique properties that are important for life on this planet. And, um, you know, surface tension and those cohesive and adhesive forces that you probably talk about when you study, um, study the water, uh, water molecule um, and its properties in general. We also might say there's a dipole or that there's two poles, a positive pole and a negative pole on water. And we sometimes represent that with an arrow pointing to the negative side. And then we make a little plus on this side. Um, this has a dipole, uh, that difference of 1.4. Um, some molecules are much more than that. Some are much less than that. What this also means if I looked at the electron cloud of water, it would be something like, let me pick a color. It would look something like this. Teachers that are available to do the video, they can. Sorry for that interruption. Um, apparently somebody's making a video uh, and not me. Um, <laughs> The So anyway, the electron cloud, because remember we really talk about electrons as being in kind of that electron cloud. Um, the electron cloud would be smaller around this end of the water molecule and much larger around this end of the water molecule. Same thing if we looked at the sodium chloride that we talked about earlier. We said that chlorine has a much larger um, electronegativity value. Chlorine has 3.0, um, where sodium is a 0 0.9. So chlorine has a much stronger affinity for electrons. So the electron cloud would be much larger around the chlorine as it has a stronger attraction for those electrons. So that's kind of it for um, uh, electronegativity and determining those, um, whether it's ionic, covalent, and so forth. Let me know if you have any questions.